This is section 5.4, Indefinite Integrals and the Net Change Theorem. And our second objective is to apply the concept of integral as net change to position, velocity, and acceleration problems. When we're done, I'd like you to be able to explain the difference between an object's actual position and the net distance that the object has traveled. So first, let's connect to what we've done already. When we first looked at Riemann sums, we motivated the discussion by examining a constant velocity curve. So we had this V of t that was a horizontal line, and when we accumulated from a to b on that velocity curve, we got the area under the curve, and that area represented the net and total distance that was traveled. The next thing we did is we extended the application to irregular but still positive velocity functions, and we again connected that net and total distance to the area beneath the curve. So what happens when the velocity is not strictly positive? Remember, velocity tells you how you're moving. So you can move right and then left. And so when that happens, that velocity curve is sometimes above the x-axis and sometimes it's below the x-axis. So when that happens, the net distance, which is also known as the displacement, and the total distance will no longer equal each other. To help make sense of this, I want to look at this picture of a velocity function where it is sometimes positive and sometimes negative. And I want to think about our old definition of displacement. We did displacement before in chapters 3 and 4. And when we did it, we always talked about where we ended up minus where we started. So in this particular case, we would take the position when time is c and subtract the position when time is a. Well, we don't have the position curve. All we've got is the velocity curve. So we're going to think about the relationship between position and velocity. Remember that position is the antiderivative of velocity. So that fundamental theorem of calculus would say that if I integrate from a to c on the velocity curve, then answering this question would be, what did I take the derivative of with respect to time that gave me the velocity? And the answer would be the position function evaluated at c minus the position function evaluated at a. So this accumulation here represents the displacement or the net distance. Total distance is going to be like an odometer reading. So when you drive to Salt Lake and then come back from Salt Lake, your net distance will be nothing, because if you start at home and end at home, you haven't gone anywhere. Where you end minus where you start will be zero, but you've added a lot of mileage onto your odometer. So with total distance, we have to think in terms of total area that is trapped between the velocity function and the t-axis. So to do this one, doing total distance will be like when we're computing the areas. So that will be the accumulation from a to b on that velocity function. And then we have to subtract the negative accumulation from b to c on that velocity function. So whatever we have underneath, we'll need to take the opposite of it to convert it to a positive odometer reading. Or, if we have a calculator, we can just go from a to c on the absolute value of that velocity curve. With example 1, without a calculator, we are given v of t is negative 2t plus 2, and we're on the interval from 0 to 3, and we want to let s of 0 equal 3. Our job is to find the net distance traveled by the particle. So the old way to do this would be using antiderivatives, because the net distance, if you remember from section 410, was where we end up minus where we started. So in this case, since we're ending when time equals 3, and we're starting when time equals 0, this is what we're going to be computing. In order to find that, we will need to know what the position function is. So we ask ourselves, what did I take the derivative of that gave me this? Well, that would be negative 2t squared over 2 plus 2t plus some constant. Simplify that, I get a negative t squared plus 2t plus some constant. And remember that we nail down the constant by using the point. So I can say the output is 3 when the input is 0. Solve for c, you get c equals 3. So now we have our position at any time will be a negative t squared plus 2t plus 3. 
and we can figure out that s of 0 is going to be 3 and s of 3 will be negative 9 plus 9. So if we want the difference between them, the displacement, we'll have s of 3 which was 0 minus s of 0 which was 3 and that gives me a 3 units to the left and that displacement equals negative 3. So now the new way using what we know about definite integrals is that displacement is going to be just the simple accumulation from 0 to 3 on that derivative. If I answer the question, what did I take the derivative of with respect to t that gave me this inside, I'll get that negative t squared plus 2t and remember when I'm evaluating definite integrals I can use any antiderivative that I want and simply evaluate at the top minus the evaluation at the bottom and I end up with that same negative 3. If we do part b now where we want to find the total distance traveled by the particle we have to think about the odometer reading so no matter which direction we're going we are still accumulating mileage on the odometer so that means we need to pay attention to the direction we need to think about when the particle is stopping and when it's backing up versus moving forward so remember that it's the velocity that tells you when things are moving forward or backwards or stopping. So we're interested in first looking at when that velocity function, which was negative 2 plus 2t two plus 2, when that equals 0. That happens when t is 1. So that means we're going to be looking at the sign chart for the velocity function from 0 to 3, knowing that at 1 we have stopped. So prior to 1, if I plug in say a half, I'll get a positive value. After 1 I'm going to get a negative value. So with my position function, remember we got it from part A, it's a negative t squared plus a 2t plus a 3. We'll be interested in knowing where we are when we start, where we are when we turn around, and where we are when we end. So if I plug 0 in, we see that we started at 3. When I plug a 1 in, I have a negative 1 plus a 2 plus a 3 gives me a 4. And when I end, if you recall, we ended up at negative 9 plus 9, which was 0. So to get the total distance traveled, we would want to know how far we went going from 0 to 1 on that time interval. And it looks like we moved 1 unit and then we moved four units backwards which will actually accumulate four more so we'll get five is the total distance that was traveled you could also look at it as the displacement when we were moving forward and then we subtract the displacement when we were moving backwards and either way we end up with that 5. So now how will we do it the new way using what we know about areas and total distance? Well we know that the area that is accumulated is going to be the same as the total distance. So we have to make sure that our integral is either left alone if that accumulation is positive or that we take the opposite of it if that accumulation is negative. So based on what we know about this velocity curve, we know accumulating from 0 to 1 is going to give us a positive number. So that will be how far we've moved to the right. And then we will subtract the accumulation from 1 to 3 when we are moving left. So if I write this up, I'll have the accumulation from 0 to 1 of negative 2t plus 2, and then the accumulation from 1 to 3 of that negative 2t plus 2. And we'll use the fundamental theorem of calculus part 2 to answer the question posed by this symbol. What do I take the derivative of with respect to t that gave me this? Well, that's a negative t squared plus 2t, and remember we can give it any antiderivative, if it's a definite integral, we can choose any antiderivative and then simply evaluate from 0 to 1. And we can do the same thing over here. Only this time we're evaluating from 1 to 3. If I plug in 1, I get a 1. 
If I plug in 0, I get a 0. Then I'm going to subtract what comes out when I plug in a 3, which is a negative 9 plus 6, minus what comes out when I plug in a 1. So I end up with that 1 minus a negative 4, which again is a 1 plus 4, or 5. Now the beauty of doing it this way is that if you have a calculator, you could also just do the straight accumulation from 0 to 3 on that absolute value function, and you would get the same answer. Now if we look further down in your notes, you'll see that we can make a connection between what we just did and the pictures of both the velocity and the position function. So here's a picture of that velocity function. If I graph negative 2t plus 2, we can see that it intersects at 1. It's above prior to 1 and it's below after. This area above is 1 unit, whereas this area below is 4 units. So if I want the net change, it will be 1 minus 4, which was negative 3. So that would be our displacement. We're 3 units further down than when we started. If, on the other hand, I want the total distance traveled, I would add the 1 and the 4. Now if we go and look at our position function, which is where we are, notice we start at 3, we climb 1 unit, and we peak out at position 4 when time is 1, and then we fall 4 units, and we end up at 0 when time is 3. So again, we can get the net change off of the picture, and we can get the total distance off of the picture. We climbed 1, and then we fell 4, so we had a net change of falling 3 units. And then if we want the total distance, we climbed 1 unit, which put a one unit on the odometer, and then we fell four units, which put another four units for a total of five units on the odometer. With example two now, we're not only going to use the calculator, but we're going to get at the nuance between distance versus position. So distance is how far you have gone, whereas position is where you actually are. So in this particular case, we are given the velocity function, and we are given a single point on the position curve. We are told that when time is 0, we are at mile marker 9, or position 9, however we want to label it. So the question is, what is the particle's position at t equals 1? So what that means is that we want s of 1. To get there, we're going to use what we know about the fundamental theorem of calculus and accumulation. If we accumulate from a to b on the velocity curve, and we are getting the net change in our position. So it's telling us how far away we are from where we started to where we end up. So this, if we think about our fundamental theorem of calculus, would be the antiderivative of velocity, which is a position function evaluated at b minus that position function evaluated at a. So here's that old displacement that we saw in section 5, 410 when we did antiderivatives, and now we're representing it as an integral. Now the interesting piece about this is that I can isolate s of b and move this s of a to the other side. And when we do that, you will see that this is actually a point on the position curve. So if we know a point on the position curve, we can get any other point on the position curve by performing an accumulation and then adding to where we started. So if I want s of 1, that's going to be where I started, which is s of 0. And then I will accumulate from when I was at that position. So from time 0 up to time 1 on that velocity curve. So this is pretty powerful. I can find any time I want the position if I just start with where I began and then accumulate from when I was at that position up to the new time that I want. On my calculator now, notice in y1 I have put that velocity function because I want to be able to accumulate it. And because I'm in the y editor, I have to use x's instead of t's. Then on the home screen, I can plug this in. I want 9 plus the accumulation of that velocity function with respect to x 
from 0 to 1. Hit diamond enter and we will get the position at time equals 1. So S of 1 equals 5.33 repeating. With part B, we want the displacement in the first five seconds. Well, that can either be S of 5 minus S of 0, or that can be the simple accumulation from 0 to 5 on that velocity function. So since we have the velocity function already in the calculator, we can just pull the calculator up and do the simple accumulation of that velocity function. from 0 to 5. And we see that the answer is exactly 35. With the final part, what is the total distance the particle travels in the first 5 seconds? Well, because we have a calculator, we can look at the accumulation from 0 to 5 of the absolute value of that velocity function. So go get the absolute value out of your catalog with respect to x from 0 to 5. Now this one will take a little longer on your calculator because that absolute value makes it work harder. So we'll wait and we see that the total distance traveled is 42.587. Now I want to connect this back to the picture that we had prior that's earlier up in your notes. We can see that we are traveling left for a time and then we were traveling to the right. So the net distance is going to be this red area minus the green area which gave us that 35. But if I want the total distance then I'm popping this up above and I'm adding the green area to the red area. The remaining examples, example 3, 4, and 5 are all difficult multifaceted problems that take time. So I've done separate videos for each of those, both for this objective and for objective three.